Well, my family and I have been greatly blessed, and at the same time, we've been painfully blessed. So I was looking for something that kind of spoke to that, where we are. So I'm going to ask you to join me in uh, singing just one line, number 314, because I believe we need to be resolved to come to Jesus every day this new year. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, before I start today, I'll shut the door so my wife won't have to motion at me to shut the door. I want to ask God to be here today. So please join me as I pray. Dear Lord, I just pray. That you will be in this place today, Lord, that you will send the Holy Spirit into this place, that you will open our eyes and open our ears, that we can hear and we can see your goodness, Lord. Help us to um, put our faith and our trust in you. Help us to become more like you, Lord. Help us to take, make this year, 2022, the year that we get closer and closer to you, Lord. Thank you for all the blessings you've given us in this past year. And we just look forward to this year, Lord, that our church can grow, that each one of us can grow closer to you, that our church can be filled with people on fire for you, Lord. That is our goal. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, most of you know that I grew up on a dairy farm, and it was kind of an unusual situation because my mom grew up on a dairy farm but my dad didn't my dad was a chicken plucker that's what he did for a living that's what my grandpa owned a chicken plucking business out on 115 uh, their house is still there right across from b and b and that's where my dad grew up and when he married my mom he moved to mcbain and when you're in rome you become roman so everybody in McBain milks cows and everybody's Christian reform. So that's what my parents became. And when I was, I was the oldest of four children. And when I was just a little kid, I remember we had a hired man. And I don't think I was over 10, 11 years old when we no longer had a hired man because dad had me. And my mom worked on the farm too her whole life. But um, I got pushed into doing things. Um, many of my neighbor boys were three, four years older than me. Uh, there was half a dozen of them. We, I went to church with all of them, went to school with all of them, and they were all three or four years older than me, which at 10 years old, three years is a lot of difference. Well, if they can do it, I can do it, right? Mm -hmm. So I would beg my dad, well, they're driving tractor. I can drive tractor. So my dad thought, well, it's better than hiring somebody. So at 10, 11 years old, I was driving tractor. I had to stand up to push the clutch and the brake in because I couldn't reach it sitting on the seat. But you improvise when you want something bad enough, right? Well, once a week, we had uh, two farms that were, uh, oh, two, three miles away. And dad would say, well, if you want to drive the tractor, you can take the wagon and your younger brother, who was about that much shorter than me, two years younger than me, and you can go get a load of hay, 100 bales of hay. 
So he would send me, and then my grandpa and grandma lived at one of the farms, and every time I went over there, they would call my dad and complain that I'm too young, I shouldn't be driving the tractor yet. So anyway, it was a big joke for years, but anyway, so I learned to drive tractor very young. Well, one day I told my dad, I can plow. Do all of you know what plowing is? You have this implement that flips the soil over, and it, the last one of the plows leaves a trail like this wide, this deep. So the next time around, you go, you put your tire in that trench, and you follow it. So your goal the first time across the field is straight as an arrow. Because it's ugly when you're doing it and you're, you know, like that. And it would drive my dad crazy if I didn't do it straight. Because the neighbors would drive by and they would see how crooked it went. And it, it would really bother my dad. So he said, well, if you can go straight, I will let you do it. So I think my first couple attempts were pretty bad. And then one day he showed me, he says, you pick out something at the end of the field. You look at a fence post or you look at a tree and you go towards it and you don't turn around until you get to the end of the field. Made a big difference. And I still kind of follow that today when I mow a lawn and if I go down the middle of it, I always pick something out at the other end of the lawn to look at. Because if you start looking behind you, it, it isn't pretty. And it kind of reminds me in life if we stay focused on what we want to focus on, if we want to focus on Jesus and keep our eyes totally on him, not on each other, because we can be led wrong, can't we? I know growing up I saw a lot of, um, in the McBain community, um, like I said, I think nine of the 12 houses on our road all went to the same church. All went to the same school, and you start saying, well, they do that and they're good people. And you start letting your guard down. And I know I remember from my growing up, when I was very small, we had different rules than when I was in high school. And I know you would think, well, Adventists aren't like that. That's not true. When you get in large Adventist communities, there's a lot more liberalism and a lot more watching each other. Luckily, we live in Northern Michigan where nobody else wants to live because of the cold, I guess. I'm sorry, I've had a cold the last week and my mouth is so dry. Lucky for Holly last Thursday and Friday, I couldn't even talk. So she had it made. But, so I just pray that my voice will hold out today. John 3, verse 14 and 15. John 3, 14 and 15. It says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. When we hear that verse, we always think of lift up Jesus. And if we lift up Jesus in our lives, we will set good examples for others, right? People will see Jesus in us. But when I read this and I started thinking about it, it also means when Jesus was talking to these people, they knew what crucifixion was. They knew when they did crucifixion, they put you on a pole and they stuck it in the ground and they put a big sign above your head what your crime was. And it was a deterrent to make other people see that and not want to be in that situation. So that's why Jesus used it. That verse can mean that too. Also, that it, it can remind us of what we don't want to do. And as a Christian, when you're struggling at sometimes, and if you get the picture of Jesus hanging on that tree, for us, and sometimes we can say, I'm, I'm not worthy. We're not worthy. But do we want to throw that gift away? Do we want to let Jesus hang on that tree for nothing? He did it for us because he loves each one of us. You remember when the Israelites were in the wandering around the desert for 40 years and they, they got sick of manna. Manna tasted very good, I guess, but they got sick of it day after day after day. And they were even like, oh, I wish we were back in Egypt where we could have a buffet every day, where we could eat different things. 
we're sick of this manna. God didn't take too kindly with their words. And God sent the snakes to punish them, to open up their eyes. And then he told Moses to make a bronze serpent, to put it on a stake up in the air, and that if anyone looked at the stake, at the serpent, they would be saved. And so many people thought, well, this is crazy, looking at a snake to save me from snakes, and they wouldn't do it. And they perished because they didn't listen to God. I'm glad we're not that stupid, right? That we don't uh, ever turn our backs on God. We can be changed by what we behold, what we look at, what we listen to, and what we surround ourselves with, with Holly's children's story. What we put into our bodies, if we watch stuff on TV that's violent, it'll probably make us more violent. If we watch things that make us more selfish, but if we surround ourselves with, with um, things that make us more holy, our lives will be so much enriched. I remember a few years ago, we went up to Camp Asabo for family camp, and we were there the whole week, and of course you're surrounded by people that aren't perfect, because we're not perfect. But you hear people being kind, and people being gracious, and people not swearing, and, and just people being really nice to be around. Well, one day we decided we're gonna go golfing. So we went golfing on a public course, and we could, this group of guys drove up and they were drinking and they were saying inappropriate things to the girl driving the cart. I can still remember that. It felt like hell almost. It was like, man, this was nice all week being around. No swearing, no taking God's name in vain, no inappropriate rude thing comments made. Just for that five minutes that we were close enough to hear those guys talking made me really realize it was pretty awesome being at Camp Asabo. It's a little piece of heaven. And like I said, it's not perfect because we aren't perfect. But it was sure being nice being around it. How many of you have ever seen white snowshoe rabbits? Well, when I lived on the farm before Holly and I got married, I had these beagle dogs and we used to hunt rabbits. And what was amazing in the summer, they were brown. Soon as the snow came, they turned white. Now, there's fox, and there's polar bears, and there's other animals that change color. In fact, when we were snorkeling, Holly saw a um, yeah, a parrotfish. And they're quite colorful. They have blue and red and green on them sometimes. She actually saw it turning color in the water because of what it was hiding under, probably because it was afraid because she was that close to it. But is that incredible? I mean, the snow doesn't change color for the rabbits, right? But the animals can actually change color to protect them. And just like the animals, we can change. We can change for the good or we can change for the bad. When Holly was teaching in Marion, she had a parent that one day they got into conversation about Christianity. And her brother had been a big partier, just serious partier. And he gave his heart to the Lord. And he was very troubled because all of his friends were still drinking and partying, doing drugs, whatever they were doing. They were living the party life. So he thought he would save his friends. So he went back and started spending time with them. Guess what happened? He fell right back into it. You know, when we want to spend time with people, when Jesus did... I don't think he went and spent time in a bar with the people. I think he spent time where he was safe and where he could be a good influence on them instead of them being a bad influence on him. Excuse me again. Oh. This is actually better than, whoa. The last few days have been horrible, trying to quit coughing and everything. But There was an Army veteran named Jim Wolf. He was living in a homeless shelter. He had long, scraggly hair, non-capped, and long fingernails. And I mean, he was just, he was an alcoholic. And he had fell into that lifestyle, 
and his life was just a mess. And some Christian people found him on the street, and they took him in, and they cut his hair, they give him a manicure, which I think you do your own, but anyway, it said they gave him a manicure, and they um, spent some time with him trying to give him confidence and tell him that Jesus loved him. And now he owns his own house, he has a job, and he's totally cleaned up because someone cared about him enough to share Jesus with him that he actually looked in a mirror and broke down and totally changed his life because someone cared. People can change, but as Christians, it's our duty to show people we care. In 2 Corinthians 3, verse 17 through 18, it says, Now the Lord is a spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So at the first part of this verse, it talks about there's liberty. We have a choice. God does not force us. We have a choice. God loves us so much, he gives us a choice. There was a small child who was thinking about the unseen Christ to whom she prayed, and she came to her mother with a question. She said, is Jesus like anybody I know? Her mom didn't know what to say. Now, if someone come to you and said that, what would you say? As Christians, shouldn't we all have part of us that reflects Jesus? All of us should have everything that reflects Jesus, but we all have flaws in our character. But shouldn't we be able to point someone to someone we respect as a Christian and point out their Christian attributes that they show? You know, many of us say, I don't know how my child or their child or so many children in our churches walk away when they walk out of church. What are your kids listening to on the way home from church? The one mistake the pastor made? The one mistake one of our fellow believers made? And we're driving home from church or during the week and we're putting down other members of our church and then we think our kids are going to want to join that church? It's not going to happen. We need to lift each other up, not tear each other down. It doesn't mean we always have to agree with each other because we obviously won't always agree with each other. But we need to be uplifting Christians. Jesus uplifted even the prostitute. Everyone. Jesus tried to uplift them because he loved them. And, it, you know, I know whether it's my kids, I love my kids. And when they make mistakes, it's very easy for us to be pretty lenient with our own children, isn't it? It's pretty easy. Too easy sometimes. But are we lenient with other people's children? Usually we don't have near as much patience with other people's children as we do our own. Then we have a problem. Of course, the mirroring never can be perfect. Muddy puddles give only dim reflections of the blue sky and bright sun. Too often our lives are like muddy puddles. A broken mirror gives a very imperfect reflection of the face that looks into it. But by beholding, we can become changed. The disciples were a perfect example. They weren't perfect people, were they? They were serious, a uh, little bit crazy people sometimes, I think. The fishermen and... They, it made it sound like they were pretty foul language and they were pretty rough characters. That's what the Bible kind of implies. But being around Jesus for three years changed them. Think of how it changed Paul. Paul was murdering Christians. And what did he do the rest of his life? He was the greatest Bible writer there was. He gave his whole heart to Jesus. And he'd do anything for Jesus. If we think of John, he was known as one of the thun sons of thunder, and yet he became John the Beloved. Now, why was that? It was because of who he had spent his time with. 
Romans 8, verse 29 says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the first among many brethren. So that's what God wants us to be. He wants us to be like his son. That's kind of a high standard, don't you think? But God predestines each one of us to be. That God wants us to be lifted up and to become like him. And we know right now, because of the internet, it can be good and it can be evil. This morning on the way to church, I forgot my sermon. We all, we're all the way to 55, and Holly says, Whoa, you have it on your iPad. And as many of you in my class know, that that's like a scary thing for me. Because it doesn't always work how I want it to work. Paper is always there. The internet can be a little sketchy at times. But we all know the internet can be incredible. We can do studies on the Bible. You can, you can say, oh, what was that quote again in, in Spirit of Prophecy? You ask your phone and three seconds later it's on the screen. It's incredible how much gifted we're having. Now, we're never going to be able to say, God, why well, I didn't know how to do that because that's pretty easy. But it also can be very distracting. Have any of you pumped gas at a station that you're pumping gas and the screen comes up and it talks about the news or whatever it's talking about? It's like you're bombarded with it because it's money. People pay to get their face on a screen. That can be good, but that can be bad. It depends what they're trying to promote. So we have to be very cautious as Christians on what the internet is doing to our lives. If it's making it better, or if it's distracting us, if it's, we're spending too much time on it for bad. We can use our phones to promote the gospel as we're doing by doing this sermon live, or we can use our phones to waste our time. I know there's times when we have family gatherings and you look around the room and everybody's on their phone. You're all in the same room. Why are we even here? We're all on our phones. It's ridiculous. So from now on at our house, you're supposed to leave your phones in your car. Right, dear? Yeah. You know, a lot of times I've heard people make excuses why their children turned out like they did. And I've heard people say things about GLA. Because there's been kids that have went to that school and come home and not stayed in the church. I have a hard time believing that it was a school. You can choose good or you can choose bad in every situation. Going to GLA doesn't make you a Christian any more than parking your car in the barn makes it a tractor. It doesn't mean you're a Christian. Because you're in church every week doesn't even mean you're a Christian. But it's choices. It's choices we make. It's choices our children make. And someday... Our kids are going to have to make their own choices. So all we can do is pray for them and equip them to make the right choices. Because someday, you know, we won't be able to protect them unless you have a way of keeping them in your house with their feet under your table. And that's not always a good idea either. I remember when our kids were growing up, I remember Holly telling my oldest daughter, I think it was one time, you know, we can really tell by the friends you're hanging around with what kind of friends they are. Because if you become a kinder, more thoughtful person, then that's good. And my kids all had friends that we really liked, and sometimes they had friends that we didn't really like a whole lot. And all you can do is limit what you can with the friends you don't want them around, but it's going to be their choice someday that they're going to have to choose the right friends because there's nothing in this world that will lead you down the path more than choosing the wrong friends. You know, we've seen people, I think we've all seen people in our lives that growing up, they chose the wrong friends. And guess what happened? They thought, oh, yeah, that won't change me. It does change you. If you're around them enough, it will change you. And more than likely, you will not be lifting them up. It'll be the other way around. 
In Psalms 101, verse 3, it says, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. So when David was saying this, he realized, you know, following God is not easy in this sinful world. But when we set our eyes on wicked things and we surround ourselves with people that aren't Christ-like, it's almost impossible to follow Jesus. We have to make choices that make our lives easier. I'm sure everyone sitting here, our goals are to follow Jesus and spend eternity with him. Why would we lessen our chances by the choices we make? We need to be careful. It doesn't mean we have to exclude everyone that we don't feel is a great Christian, but we do have to limit our time with people when they are not lifting us up, when they're not following Jesus. Job 31 verse 1 says, I have made a covenant with my eyes. When then should I look upon a young woman? And Job was realizing uh, the, one of the greatest temptations, a friend of mine had a guy that worked for him, and he had broken into their house when they weren't home, and he took some of his wife's clothing. And I remember him saying, you know, this guy was a decent enough guy. You'd, talking to him, you'd think he was a decent enough guy. You'd never think he had some serious issues going on, but he did. And I remember the state cop had told my friend David, he said, that is the hardest thing to ever get anybody to break away from, is the addictions like this guy has. We can be down that road, and Satan can use that. And um, if you haven't noticed, we're kind of surrounded with it in ads. We're surrounded with it everywhere. You have to, on your phone, things can pop up just out of nowhere. And you delete, and it can come again. One thing we want to make sure we do, especially as men, I think, is never hide your phone from your wife. You know, they always say, pick a guy to be your accountability partner. Partner, I don't think you have to pick a guy because my biggest accountability partner is my wife. She can be on my phone anytime she wants to. I don't care. She can listen to any conversation I have with anybody. I don't care. She'll correct my punctuation, and I don't care. But I do not hide things from her, and it should never be the other way around either. We shouldn't have things hidden from each other. And I think as parents, to make sure that and when kids think that that's my phone, I don't think I would ever go for that. There should never be anything on a child's phone that their parents shouldn't be able to see or hear anytime they want to. We have to be smart. This world tries to eat you out. In John 12, verse 32, it says, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. So we can be lifted up from the earth if we follow Jesus and we give our hearts to him. In Luke 19, 8 through 9, it's the story of Zacchaeus when he was up the tree. <laughs> Holly and I always joke about this because people that were raised Adventists always say Zacchaeus, and people that weren't say Zacchaeus. So I don't know if we should have a poll, but I like Doug Batzer because he says Zacchaeus because most Adventists say Zacchaeus. But anyway, the story of Zacchaeus was... Uh, a tax collector, and he was not a very nice person. He was very dishonest. And when he met Jesus, you think it changed him? He invited Jesus to his house. Now, what would have happened if Jesus would have said, no, I'm not going to your house. You're a nasty little man. I don't want to spend time with you. What will people think of me if I spend time with you? What if Jesus would have said that to him? But he didn't. Jesus was glad to go to his house. And Zacchaeus proved his faithfulness because when he, when he said in, Zacchaeus, or in a Luke 9, Zacchaeus 9, Luke 9, Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I have half of my goods to the poor, and if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. So do you think he was sorry? for what he had done. He had totally surrendered. 
He had totally given his heart to Jesus. Christians are considered fanatical by the world. But the world thinks nothing of obsessions of sports, of obsessions with actors. They think nothing of it. It's normal. People spend thousands of dollars to go see one stupid football game in the snow. You think anybody would pay money to sit in the snow and go listen to somebody preach? I think if somebody tells us we're fanatical Christians, we should say thank you. That would probably be a good thing. The Christian life is a battle and a march. In this warfare, there is no release. The effort must be continuous and preserving. It is by unceasing endeavor that we maintain the victory over the temptations of Satan. Christian integrity must be sought with resistless energy and maintained with resolute fixedness of purpose, ministry of healing. That was a mouthful. Oh, can't breathe again. For once, more than just my sense of humor is dry. <clears throat> the Christian life is a battle and a march. So does that mean that once you've attained it, then we can coast? Because if we start coasting, we're going to slide backwards. We need to be on fire for Jesus. We need to stay on fire for Jesus. We need to give our hearts to him, live for him, and lift each other up. As a church family, we have that obligation that if we love Jesus, we should lift each other up, that we should help each other. This isn't easy. The battle, a battle doesn't mean easy, but it means committed. Christian integrity must be sought with energy and maintained. So no matter what, people have to see we have integrity in our jobs, in anything we do. We have to be seen as people with integrity. In Isaiah 45, verse 22, it says, Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. <clears throat> So it makes it pretty simple, right? If we look to God, if we keep our eyes focused on him. Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2 says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great <clears throat> a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance a race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So if we remember that, it's a race, it's not a sprint, it's a long race. We need to keep focused on Jesus, no matter what happens in our lives. We need to be thankful, we need to be positive, and we need to be uplifting. We need to fix our eyes on Jesus. I point you to the life of Jesus as a perfect pattern. His life was characterized by disinterested benevolence. Precious Savior, what sacrifices has he made for us that we should not perish, but have everlasting life? Heaven will be cheap enough if we resign every selfish interest to obtain it. So what are we willing to do for Jesus? Are we willing to give up everything? Are we willing to give up being comfortable? You know, sometimes I've had situations where I could have shared my faith and I wanted to get home from work. I was sick of being there. I've been there since five in the morning. I want to get home. You ever do that and you go home and you think, what if I would have spent five minutes sharing my faith with somebody? We don't want to have regrets. We don't want to get to heaven and somebody's not there and we think, you know what, what if I would have witnessed to them? We need to pray that Jesus will give us the opportunities to share our faith and we won't blow it. And if we blow it, we'll keep trying. 
It is a race. And Paul says that we need to endure to the end. So that should be our goal. To give our hearts to him and to follow him and to never give up. Dear Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity that we have to be in this church family, to be in this community, to have the families and friends around us that we do. Lord, we're so thankful that we have so many tools in our hands right now. We have Strong Tower Radio. We have our phones. We have our sermon online. Lord, we have so many opportunities to show people that we love you. Help us not to be shy. Lord, help us to be not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we're willing to share it with anyone that will listen. Help us live it out in our lives. Help us to be faithful, to have integrity, and to never give up. Lord, help us to um, reflect your character in everything we do and everything we say. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For our, for our closing song, should we turn to page 290? 290. thank you that you've given us Jesus. We thank you that we can look to him. 
We've spent too much of our time wallowing in self-pity, dwelling on things, Lord, that bring us down and don't uplift, in listening to things and watching things and surrounding ourselves with things, Lord, that cause us to fail. But you have given us Jesus, and we know that if we put our eyes on him, if we focus on his love for his, his grace, his righteousness, that it will come through and we will be able to live with victory through him and that his character can be reflected in us, that the fruits of the spirit can be seen through us. And Lord, this is what we pray for each and every one of us, that our priorities will be straight, that we will be like Jesus because Jesus resides in us. We thank you and praise you that this victory can be accomplished in each and every one of us. And we claim it for this year. In Jesus' name, amen.